up is uh, Mr. Medica <laughs> himself, uh, uh, HR manager over at Medica, um, Mr. Gregory Owens. That's yeah, Greg, man. Well, you guys know my whole background, Rick, because I told you about everything, right? <laughs> Not really, but anyway, I, honestly, I'm honored, just like you getting to be invited even to here. And, and for me, and I'll talk a little bit about my background. I'm not here necessarily just to sell Medica. I mean, we, it's a great company. I'm happy, I've been there for 12 and a half years. Um, and I don't take that lightly. When I told the CEO when I was being interviewed, and that's unusual for a manager to be interviewed by the CEO, but he happened to be available and my boss's office was right next to his. I said, well, you're gonna be the CEO? I was like, yeah, I guess, you know. It's like, I wasn't expecting that, but uh, he, he asked me a question. He said, Rick, why here? Why Medica? And I said, you know, um, what I do, I can do anywhere, but where I do it and who I do it with is most important to me. That's why I chose Medica, okay? And in the jobs that I've had, I've worked for all the, it's probably in the bio, I don't know if you guys got that, but I worked at Prudential, I worked at Aetna, I worked at TCF Bank for 12, for 10 years, or McKesson, anyone know who McKesson is, first of all? McKesson, if you go to the doctor's office, you see McKesson blue and orange everywhere. Uh, it's the largest drug dealer in the country. McKesson, they do everything. They're based out of San Francisco. They're Fortune 3 company. I didn't know that. Never heard of them before. But all that equipment, all those computers, all those robotics and stuff, that's McKesson. As, as well as drug distribution and all those type of things. You know, I, so I work for companies like that. But I worked at Medica now for <clears throat> 12 and a half years. Uh, my background is a little bit different. I'm a little bit further on in my career than perhaps Kenny, you are. Uh, kind of been there, done it. I worked in the human resources my whole career, I would say that. I started out, people asked me, but no one question, I was talking to the University of Minnesota Carlson School um, for an old boss of mine. He teaches a class, classes there, and um, where I work with Leslie Philman also, but he, he asked us to introduce ourselves and tell, tell the, the students, and these are all college students for all 20, 22 years old, 21 years old, whatever, 18. How'd you get an HR? It's like, that was so long ago, I don't remember. <laughs> but I just kind of, I needed a job. Well, it kind of was. I went to school for accounting and computer science, if you can believe that, because I'm an introvert, right? Right? Because <laughs> I'm an introvert. And um, I just happened, I got married young and needed a job, and I had connections to go to Prudential. I worked for them in a summer in, uh, internship kind of program after high school. And um, just by knowing people at Prudential, and they knew that I had connections in the community, even though I'm an introvert, I had connections in the community to get out and talk to people. They asked me if I wanted to go into, into the recruiting area. It's like, sure, you know, I didn't know. I, it was more money, um, so I took it. So ever since, I've, I've kind of done it all since then. Though. I mean, I've been all parts of human. First of all, does anyone know what human resources does? That's a dumb question. Mm -hmm. Yes, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, bore you guys with that. But anyway, I've kind of done it all. I've been in recruiting. Um, I've been in, uh, my background is more of a generalist, so supporting departments and stuff like that, whatever they need. Um, I've done training. I've done orientation. I've done kind of all that. But really, my specialty has been, been as a generalist and for the past 12 and a half years, employment relations and employment law. Uh, so... Yeah, I, I had no energy coming here today. I Trust me, I was just wiped out. I tell people if they want a job and not worry about job security, go into employee relations. <laughs> and the reason for that is, you know, these companies work with human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Human beings have issues. They will never stop having issues that have to be resolved. Um, yes, a lot of my job is interpreting policy, company policy, and employment law, you know, keeping the company out of trouble, stuff like that, but it's incredible things people can think of. <laughs> you know, we have a book um, that my boss and I are kind of writing. We haven't actually put it down yet, but we're like on, on chapter 17. The title of the book is, So What Were You Thinking? Seriously. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, it's some, sometimes it's like being in junior high school because people are humans and they have issues. On, on, on that end, they also have other issues that we help them with, you know, because people, the, the adage used to be, you know, I don't want to hear your problems, leave them at the door. That, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. People are human beings. 
and you want to treat them as such. Because first of all, they got a choice. They can go someplace else. We want to keep them there. You need to help them. You know, we have a strong EAP program. But we're a health insurance company. People know Medica at all? You guys know Medica? Yeah, I work for United. So. Oh, United Medica, business yeah, partner. Yeah. So <laughs> you know the drill. Yeah. Exactly. And actually, Medica used to be a part of United years and years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Medica started out as PHP, if you, any of you guys remember that, Physicians Health Plan, years ago. The first open access healthcare company, <coughs> insurance, health insurance company. And uh, it combined with SPAN and then another company, and they formed a lineup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Share. They, they combined with Share. So they had clinical and insurance all in one business as a lineup. Then in like 2001, Mike had the former attorney general, now Pete, you know. But it's like they broke them up. It's like, no. And Minnesota used to have to um, be a nonprofit to work, to be headquartered in the state of your health right. insurance provider, okay? That has changed recently. That's why United now is yeah. in the business, right? Right. Um, and, and exactly. They're selling business in Minnesota specifically yeah. now, you know. There are companies that they sell to before who had branches in Minnesota, but really, if you're based in Minnesota now, and so they're our competition as well as still our business partner, which is just interesting. <laughs> Yeah, we're still slowly, slowly separating, but uh, yeah, people, if like my my insurance card right now, I pull it out, it has you got health care in the back. I, when I call, I get one of them from their customer service area, you know, and that's the arrangement we have, okay. Um, but again, I've been in medical 12 and a half years, and I kind of, you, you probably can't shock me with anything. You might surprise me a little bit, but you, you probably can't shock me with anything. Because I've kind of seen it all. That companies like Medica United, um, either they've been out there or they certainly advanced are now out there. And that's probably the start of it, you know. Recognizing that, first of all, there's a lot going on. I mean, the George Floyd thing obviously brought up, opened up a lot of eyes. But these are things that have been going on. And some companies have been out there already helping out communities. And uh, it's certainly amped up even more so. And I'm, I'm pleased that we see that, you know, as I get later in my career. It's good to know. I mean, Prudential, who I used to work for, was always out there. They were community-based, blah, blah, blah. TCFs in the community, blah, blah, blah. But really understanding what's going on in the community, how they can really help. As And Marcus, my son, is in, he's a CEO, executive director at ALF, African American Leadership Forum. He'll tell you about this a little bit. But he was on panels with like my CEO, John Naylor, talking about what these companies can do. And everybody's talking about, you know, hey, clutch, why? No, no, no. I mean, we need that, absolutely. But we want you to make a commitment to other things, to like hiring, you know, providing livable wage incomes in the communities. I mean, we love our Minnetonka. Medical, what they just did was, and I used to tell them this all the time when I first started, it's like, that's great and wonderful. I mean, most people do drive, right? A lot of people don't, though. Mm -hmm. You know, getting there by public transportation. I said, if I live, and I live, I used to live around Lynn Park, but we're on Brooklyn Park now. I said, if I want to take a bus to Medica, I have to take a bus a half hour downtown, another half hour out to Minnetonka. I said, that's, why would I do that if I'm making 25000 30000 a year? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot of time, both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, two hours of travel, two and a half hours of travel is just not worth it, you know. And so we've talked about some things like having remote sites in the city for like customer service, for example. But also what we've done is do things like, especially this COVID just, the blessing in it, if there is, is it forced companies to do things they've never thought they'd ever do before. Like right now, and quick, very quick story, because I just have to, because I planned this big speech and I'm just going to use this. It's not going to be funny anymore. <laughs> but, you know, it really isn't. But I had an epiphany the other, like two weeks ago. And I've been working home since March, March 16th. So it's been six months. I had my, just had my sixth anniversary, six, year, six month anniversary. Got a, $25 Amazon car for my boss. I was going to have these. But what it does is, and I was sitting there thinking about this, is like when you go corporate and maybe you guys want to own your own businesses and thank you if you do, go for it. You know, but if you're working for a corporation, you know this, um, you start your career out and you think about where you want to be. People have heard of the corner office. What does that mean to you guys? What does the corner office mean? What does it look like? Everybody's bothering me. You got a secretary. <laughs> you got a secretary. <laughs> what does it physically look like? The windows, right? The windows. Yeah. Yeah. The corner yeah. office got the window overlooking the skyline. And not that I have aspired to do all of this, 
I'm sure, I'm sure somewhere in my mind I was like, I want to crawl on this one day. <laughs> so I had this picture that I presented to this class at U. And the first picture, um, it shows a glass, the, the glass window, corner office, overlooking the skyline, maple furniture, chrome and leather, retro seats, the whole nine yards, right? That's what everybody's aspiring for. They climb over folks to get to that. And once they get there, they made it, right? I'm sitting at my, in my office. I was like, wait a minute. I have a corner office. The windows aren't quite the same. I have just one window over here, double bank window. I've got a private bathroom. It's like, man, I made it. I'm sitting in my bedroom, of course, when I say this. <laughs> <laughs> Facing a corner and doing my work. <laughs> but I got a corner office. So, you know, the point of that, what I told the students was make sure you have clear expectation on what you're looking for, regardless of what you do. So that you know when you're going to be successful. How do you know you're, you're, you're successful if you don't know what your, your expectations are? We tell people all the time at work when we support managers, set clear expectations. Because you may say, well, you told me this. Well, that's not what I meant. You know, set clear expectations because you might get what you don't expect. You know, if I got this little picture that shows me with a, sitting at a table and I got my monitor sitting in a corner and it's got a little folder table and stuff. So that's my... That's my uh, corner office. But anyway, I um, want to talk about medical, but I also want to talk about, as a human rights person, this is for you guys, ask me anything. You know, James talked about this in terms of, we've got the HR manager there. Hey, what do you look for? I can tell you, and I, I actually, was it last week or two weeks ago that, uh, what's his name was here, Aaron, Aaron Schmitz. Yeah. I actually took his numbers down because he actually did my job for me. <laughs> he really did. Because he said something, in, in addition to kind of his story and how, how he lives his life and what he sets kids up for, I think that's just a beautiful illustration when he talked about, you know, your parents start here and you want to be here so you can get your kids here. And that's not even where you really want to be in terms of wealth, in terms of stability for your family and stuff like that. But it's so true. And most of us started somewhere. I started way down here, and I might be here. Hopefully, Marcus and Gregory and other and the girls are over here, you know, so they can keep moving and stuff. But he said some really interesting things, and I actually took some notes. But he he really did my job as far as, you know, explaining what companies or HR in this case looks for. How many are working for a company now? I know you are. I know you are. How about you two? So I'm in college. Okay. Okay. Um, Master Barber. Oh, where? At? The Southside Barber Lounge. Really? Okay. Okay. I just, I just, you know Houston White by chance? I do. I just golf with Houston. He's a, he's a friend, and he's doing some things. Yeah, some kind of life going on. Wait a minute. Fortieth in Chicago. Fortieth in Chicago. So you're down the street from my sister-in-law. Exterior image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my sister. My wife's sister. She's a master barber also. Yeah. So, small world. But anyway, working working for a corporation, you really kind of have to understand uh, what you want, how you get there and stuff. But as far as what HR looks for, it really is what do the managers look for. You know, our job is to make sure that within reason that the managers are looking for the right thing and they're consistent and they're fair, they're not breaking any laws. But when you listen to what he talked about, this is some of the things I wrote notes on. This is like, thank you for doing my job. Come to work on time. Show up. I mean, literally, come to work on time and show up. And show up means more than just being there, not just showing up, but showing up. Like you mean it. Like you really want to be here. Um, yeah, and again, depending on what, set expectations for yourself so you understand. I mean, if you just want a job to get paid, go home after eight hours or whatever, and that's all you want to do, that's all you're going to get. If your expectations are to be somewhere else, though, then you really got to show up and show up better than the next person because everybody else is trying to do the same thing you're doing as far as getting ahead and stuff, right? He talked about having a good work ethic. And some people feel they have good work ethics. It's like, well, it depends. Some people weren't even taught that. You know, so we're going back, and in particular, it's something we've done. We, we have internship programs that we're working with. We were also work with a uh, high school program that happened in the last five years um, where they teach not only computer help desk type skills, but also life skills. 
you know, what does it mean to show up? You know, what, what does it mean to be on time? Because I'll tell you, most people say, well, I got here at six o'clock, I was on time. No, if you got there at six o'clock and you're supposed to be at six, you're probably late already. You know, those things make a difference because people are making those judgments. Is it legal? Is it illegal to say that, well, you know, they came in at one minute after six? No, it's not illegal, but a company will hold that against you. Things, small things like that. And a lot of people weren't taught those things. They don't teach those, they don't teach wealth, economics, all those stuff, all the things in school. They don't teach you what it is to show up for work, be on time, what does that actually mean? What you should do when you get there? Uh, he talked about uh, putting in effort, having good body language. I mean, it's amazing. Trust me, I work in human resources and employee relations, and I know people and they're human. Not only the people who work, but I'm talking about the managers as well. And I have to deal with their biases, you know, some of them are conscious, some of them are unconscious. They don't know that they like a person look a certain way or act a certain way, things like that. We're going through, again, unconscious and conscious bias training for all of our staff, particularly our managers, because there are things that you don't know you do that impact other people. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's like, oh, well, well yeah, I mean, it's, when you look in your department and everyone looks at you, why is that? They're all talented. We get that. Medical, our average age, we have almost 2,000 employees. And our average age, because we hire experience. We hire experience. It's 42 and a half. That's the average age. And we're talking even call center people. We hire experience. And so you got a lot of people there who have different opinions about life and experience. They've had different experiences and such, you know. And we have to, in employee relations, I have to dig through all of that stuff. And when we do this training, unconscious or conscious bias, it's amazing because I learn stuff about myself too. You know, it may not be just black and white or an age thing, but you'd be amazed some of the things you think to yourself, oh shoot, I'll do that too, you know? And uh, we have to go through that so people can at least recognize, first of all, that these things are happening. This is how I'm making decisions. If everybody is a certain height, why is that? How could that possibly happen? You know, you think about things like the presence that we had over the years in the United States. If you look at them, there's a reason why they all are a certain height, because people have biases, you know? Um, what school you went to, maybe what organization you volunteer for. People don't tell you these type of things, that those things are so important. When uh, a manager is looking at you and making a decision on whether they're gonna hire you or promote you. I had a manager and it worked out, it worked out, but it took me, it, it was very difficult for me to see it happen, but this is years ago. And a manager, and I, he was promoting another, he was promoting a salesperson to a manager role, a director role actually. And um, his rationale was, he reminds me of me. <coughs> oh wow, well can you give me something else? Like some, does he have any experience managing people? Well no. Well I didn't either though when I was growing up. It's like, but if you perpetuate that, you'll never have diversity for example. You'll never have inclusion. You'll hire and promote <coughs> people who remind you of you. You really will. This is human nature. And it's not necessarily illegal, except for we start reviewing things and saying, what have you done? And because we're a government contract and we have to do certain things, we'll say, well, we weren't intentionally doing anything, but you know, adverse impact happens just because that's how you think, right? So we have to train people on that as well. Okay. But uh, he also talked about a positive attitude. And that's I wasn't quite sure if that's how I would phrase it because what is a positive, what's a positive attitude? You have to put some adjectives around that one. I mean, positive, a bad attitude versus a positive. We know what it looks like, right? But be specific about that because that is important. And I would tell you this, um, a lot of it is, and this is what I want to get to, all things he said have passion, which is important. Be coachable, heaven forbid. Do the extra. Come prepared. I actually, I'll admit this, I came prepared. I came yesterday, because I thought it was Wednesday. <laughs> I came up and there was nobody here. It's like, wait a minute. I didn't know what day it was. But anyway, uh, the point is, especially if you're owning your own business, or if you want to work for a corporation and you're going to climb the ladder or whatever, but especially if you're going to own your own, think about who you would hire. This is what you dreamed of, perhaps. You put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. 
it's your money, it's you paying the bills, it's you feeding your kids, or whatever the case might be, who do you want to hire? Again, making sure it's legal, <laughs> make sure you're not discriminating against people, things like that, but who do you want to hire? Do you want to hire your best friend? You know how he is. <laughs> Can you trust him with your keys to the business when you go to Jamaica to visit me, because that's where I'm going to be? No. Why would you hire him? That's not the person you want, right? Think about that. And a great story that I heard from my own son, he used to work for and run Neon. Anybody heard of Neon? You know, Economic Opportunity Network. They're right on Broadway near Fremont. But anyway, they help small businesses get started. They do business plan for you. They help you finance and stuff like that, right? And uh, we were having lunch over at Brick and Grant one day, and he said, this is, this is when he first got started. And he said, I had a dude coming to me, and he said he wants to start his own business. I said, okay, all right, that's why we're here. So what do you want to do? He said, I want to open up a hand car wash. Does anyone know of any other hand car washes in the state of Minnesota? Hand car washes. It's a big thing in Cleveland, my brothers live, but not here, right? So you want to do that. But he said, what I want to do is hire people from the neighborhood. It's like, okay, cool. That sounds good. Uh, people, and he had been in prison. He said, you know, it's hard to get a job when you, when you have a record. It really is hard anywhere to, to, to get a job, right? Uh, so he wanted to do that. And Marcus said, I'm talking to him. Okay, let's talk about business plan. He said, well, hire people. I want to pay them a good wage um, and help them out. He said, well, that's admirable. But it's also a business, and you got to be there as a business. you got to stay open to be able to pay them. So you need a plan in terms of you know, how much soap do you need, how much water do you need, how much I mean, housing, all those things. So he said, let's take a, let's take a journey. And he went over to Octopus Car Wash, I think it's over in Golden Valley, whatever, to see what happens with a business. This guy had a great idea, but it's like, it's still a business, though, and you can't help other people unless you can help yourself. It doesn't mean being <clears throat> selfish, but it means you gotta be able to survive, you gotta put your business hat on. And it's also about, yeah, helping people at the same time, who are you gonna trust with your keys, you know? And it doesn't mean I'm a, just pick and choose randomly, but I'm set clear expectations of what I need. You know, just like Aaron was talking, all these things you need in any job, in any company, really, it's what they look for. Human resources is no different. Uh, we just wanna make sure the managers don't go way out there and. They start doing some things that's going to get the company in trouble, you know. In employee relations, you know, my job is to help the company mitigate the risk, uh, making sure we're not doing things illegal, immoral, unethical, stuff like that, and just doing the right thing, you know, by people. And as we know in this environment that we work in, we need so much more of that. We really, really do. And there's so much that companies can do and are doing now, finally, are waking up to it. We're all in this together. We really, really are. And there's no simple answer to these problems that we're having. Uh, yeah, some people are going to get rubbed the wrong way. Uh, some people are going to be uncomfortable. Some of the conversations we're having, I'm still worried myself, are we ready to have that real conversation at work? You know, I'm kind of, I'm going to help, but I'm going to keep my eyes open. Because I've already told my boss, I said, I'm not sure if we're ready for that real conversation yet. Because that's uncomfortable. And, and diversity, education, equity, inclusion, that's an uncomfortable conversation to have for some people. It really is. Admittedly. Like, you know, my comment on that, I was having a similar conversation in the barbershop with one of my customers, and I, and I said, I said the question truly is, are white people ready to have that conversation? Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, we ain't got no problem telling you if you're going to ask us. Well, right. right. But are you ready to hear what we have to say? Are right. you ready to hear this truth and accept it and then listen and not be offended when you hear something that is foreign to you? Like you said, you haven't been introduced to certain things. So... Mm -hmm. A lot of times people hear or see something foreign, they don't know how to deal with it. So the first response, the first well, reaction is a defensive, right? defensive mechanism. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's like, wait a minute, I didn't do that. Right. Yeah. I definitely had a situation happen like that. Um, when I was a manager at Hy-Vee and one of my cooks I thought was really cool with me and he was white. And I was just sharing with him my experience of going into a restaurant in Woodbury and the looks I was getting. Yeah. And we really fell out over that. Like, he didn't believe me. He was like, no, yeah. like you're just tripping. <laughs> like, nobody looking at you. You're just tripping. And, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and we didn't, we wasn't friends after that because right. he didn't mm -hmm. understand where I was coming from when right. I was explaining yeah, it. It's, it's hard. It's hard yeah. to get someone. First of all, what, what I find difficult is um, in everyday life, we're talking, I'm not going to get into politics, but even in politics, the question is, and I have to decide myself this. 
where I want to take this. And um, as I bring stuff up, what's my approach? What's my goal? Begin with the end. This is Stephen Covey thing. Begin with the end in mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's my goal? If I want to complain about it, that's a goal. If I want you to understand, that's a goal. If I want to have a dialogue with you, that is another goal. The question is, you know, because I am tired, honestly, of having a conversation. I really, really am, because no one wanted to listen. Right. Now I'm glad that people are waking up and they're starting to be open to that. But the question is, you know, because I, I have a lot I want to say, and probably have done a lot. I've been the post of one for companies before, and I said, I, I can't do that anymore in my life. I can't. I'm going to let someone else do that. But it's how do you have that conversation in whatever you do on these hot topic issues? How can you have that conversation and keep it going? Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't want, I'm not going to point you out, Kenny, but that's okay. You know, if I'm having a conversation with you, you know, I can offend you and I can say, take it, mm -hmm. listen to me. He can walk away and I can solve anything. If my goal was to have a conversation with him, open dialogue about it, I mean, honest. And I know people like that. Kenny wouldn't be here if he didn't want to have an open dialogue about stuff. Yeah. And those are people, it's great and wonderful, you know, to say, hey, look, I had, a, I had a friend, have had a friend that we used to work in human resources years ago at Prudential. I hired him, actually. He worked in another part of Prudential. White dude, same age, you know, done well for himself, grew up in Monticello, Buffalo. Yeah. And um, we recruited together, traveled together the whole nine yards, done things perfect. Anybody bold? Anybody, no, bowl, anybody, <laughs> anybody bowl? I was going to bring up a bowling story, but I'm a bowler. There are people who bowl, and there are bowlers. I'm a bowler. There are people who golf, and they're golfers. I'm a, I, go, I golf. I'm not a golfer. Okay. But uh, anyway, so we didn't really have a falling out. We really haven't talked since this happened. It's been probably three, four years now. But um, he was online, and I caught the first part of it. And it was a, that sensitive subject. You know, it's more about economics and stuff, but it had to do with 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 a race issue. And the two people we were talking to were classmates of James and I, okay? And uh, his default, this guy, this friend of mine, his default always, well, I like my 401k. It's like, hmm. Which is always the default. It's like, well, I said, I said, Rick, uh, the people you are talking, just understand, they haven't, off, well off as you do. They've done those same type of things. They're not speaking from an I standpoint. They're talking about a we. There are people who are in situations who haven't had it like we've had it for many different reasons, no fault of their own, okay? And have been pushed down and continue to be pushed down. You can only be pushed down so far and so often, you know, before you start making unfortunately bad decisions or whatever. But or you get tired of it. You just really get tired of it. Okay, so he's going back and forth. Oh, yeah, this and that. And, and then he brought up, he said, well, I've been discriminated before once in my life. It's like, hmm. And I remember the story, too. It's like, <laughs> Rick, I know that, you know. But I was trying to explain to him, because I want to have a conversation with him. I thought we could have an open conversation about, hey, look, when they're talking about what's going on in the country and, you know, being discriminated against or whatever, they're not talking about them personally. They're talking about people like them. You're talking from an I standpoint, because that's all you're worried about. You know, you've done your thing, you've raised yourself up. Well, yeah, but your dad, your stepfather gave you two cars when you were growing up. They helped you pay for school. Grant, you paid for most of it, but they helped you out that way. They helped you with a down payment of your house and stuff like that. That's what generational wealth would do for you, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, don't forget those things. So you've had that opportunity where other people have it. I'm not saying poor them and blah, blah, it's an excuse. I'm telling you that the people you're talking to, they've done those things you've done. They're talking, though, from a we standpoint. That you, they're talking about a community. You're just talking about you, you and your family, your your two kids and your wife. That's all you're talking about. Okay, and um, and so we we had that conversation, but it just shut off. You know, that's the thing. It's like I thought he was the type of person we could have that conversation open. It's like Rick, you've been you've been blessed. You you're you're in a privileged situation, even though I know you work hard. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking that away from you, but understand where you're at. Way over here, when you started out, you're talking to people who started way over here. They may be over here now, but they know a lot of people over here. And so let's have a conversation so it doesn't just shut it down. You know what I mean? Again, begin with the end of mind. What are you trying to accomplish here? Yes, I want to just talk to him, 
and complain to him and we can have our differences and stuff. Then what happens is unfortunately people get mad and you know, I'm gonna call him out his name, I'm gonna call him out my name, stuff like that, we're gonna fight, whatever, it's over. But we never solve any problems. So the question is how do we I haven't solved that problem, answer that question. How do we have that honest conversation? Because I told my boss, bosses, I said, I'm not sure if we're ready for that conversation in corporate America. I don't know who we are. Now we'll see because we are doing some things right now that's gonna make some people uncomfortable. But hopefully in a good way, you know what I mean? Hopefully people can understand, and you know this country right now is kind of divided along different lines and stuff like that, and that's sad and unfortunate, but it's like, how do we, how do we get people to really hear? You know, I, I, I get tired sometimes of yelling. I do, I swear I do. I want someone to say, just, just acknowledge. <laughs> you know, we're different, we came from different backgrounds, we don't have the same advantages. We work five times as hard to get half of what you got. Just listen to what I'm saying, you know, have an honest conversation about it and say, yeah, maybe I wasn't the person who pushed someone down, but I didn't say anything either. I haven't done anything either. I haven't gone on my way either. And, you know, especially when you're in the church, it's like, why should, aren't we serving the same God? Mm -hmm. You know, we both say we serve Jesus Christ. Why should there be a difference? You know, so having that conversation is hard, you know. I'm like you, it's like, you guys don't really get this, really. I mean, the George Floyd thing woke up a lot of people. It really did, you know? And and I certainly hope that a lot of good will come out of it. I really do. Because mm-hmm. a lot of good is needed in this country. It really does, in our community. Did, you, did they wake them up or were they shook? You know, because I think they're more shook than they, was, than they were That's probably awakened. a good word. That's probably a good word because to be awoken it means you were sleeping, you know what's going on. Right. A lot of people just are, were in denial about right. it. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's, and it's easy to get that way sometimes. It's like, you know, it's not happening to me. I'm living my life. Life is hard enough as it is, right? Mm-hmm. Trying to feed your kids, do the things, you know. But are you helping <laughs> out? That's why I tell people, there's just two things I want to leave you guys with. One is, you guys know what zero-sum game is? Have you heard that term before? You know? Basically means for me to win, I got to make sure you lose. Mm-hmm. At the end of the game is like if I got a dollar, we got to first agree to win the same game, right? Mm-hmm. And if, if there's a dollar out there, uh, for me to get a dollar, that's the end of the game. You've got to have zero. And life shouldn't have to be like that. It's not always like that. I mean, there's competition and stuff. There really, really is. We grew up in sports, and we, I mean, we're competitive as it as it can be, you know. But life doesn't always have to be a zero sum game. It really doesn't. You know, and I would encourage you guys to, whatever you do, um, help out other folks too. Yeah, you got to take care of you, but help out too. Help out your community. Because invariably, even if you're selfish, it's going to impact you where you live, how you live. You know, how you live with other people, it's going to come back to you. Even if you're selfish, do it for those reasons, but help your communities out. Also, one last thing. 